Hi, Oscar. How are you doing? Well, welcome to Venezuela in Focus. How are you doing? This is a home edition of Venezuela in Focus, a special edition. Uh, we haven't uh, been able to um, have a show in months because of the crisis, um, because there, the internet is very bad where, where we live in Venezuela. And uh, well, we decided let's do a home edition. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people doing podcasts from home. Uh, and so we can too. Yes, and um, especially because several things, not only because of the coronavirus, but also our reality in Venezuela is really complex. We have, you know, shortages of electricity, gas. I mean, the gas thing we were talking about way before the, the coronavirus crisis and also the water running. We don't have regular water. I mean, it is tough, especially with this, you know, sanitary conditions that we have to, you know, remain at home, washing our hands and all that. Imagine that without any regular water service. Yeah, we actually uh, filmed uh, a show of Venezuela in Focus, but we were never able to upload it to the internet because it was so long and so heavy and our internet is so uh, bad. So we haven't been able, hopefully this one, we will make it happen. Well, we're, we're doing miracles here because one was recorded by your computer, so it wasn't possible at all to upload it. So let's see if this works. Let's see, Oscar, I want to ask you a favor and let's make, right now that we're making this podcast and a special edition and a special format, let's do something very particular. Some days ago, I was asked to deliver a conference and a speech concerning technology, democracy, and the coronavirus, the pandemic itself. And that was made in, in Spanish. So a lot of people ask me, why do not do it in English? So doing it in English, preparing it in English, it takes you know, a while and practicing a little bit. My English is not you know, well enough probably for, a, for a, a, a conference like that. So I will ask you, what if we talk some of the aspects they were there so it can make both tasks at the same time, the podcast and also this special content that I had it in Spanish, so have it in English. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I saw uh, the, the lecture you did. Uh, I think it's very relevant to our times right now because uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are interested in why is Venezuela living this pandemic differently or how is it handling it differently? I mean, I've been asked several times um, by my colleagues in Europe if the fact that we are living under an authoritarian regime um, actually improves the, the conditions of uh, taking quarantine seriously and not uh, um, uh, and, and, and being able to restrict people from going in the streets. What do you think about that? Do you think that uh, being in an authoritarian regime actually improves the, the conditions for the virus not to spread because people are staying at home? Um, well, there are, the there are a lot of issues you know, here together. So more or less, that was the presentation I did. It was called the govern, government of data and information. But then I move it a little bit into the pandemics and also this political and democratic stuff. Let's begin, like, well, mentioning, I write in a newspaper, a famous, uh, most important newspaper in Venezuela that is called El Nacional. I write, my column is last Friday of each month. So more or less, I talk about it. Pandemics, technology, and freedom, that was called. And that's the, the presentation I did in Spanish. So you can help me here with some ideas in English. Well, we have seen, we have seen in the past uh, months that there has been persecution of journalists uh, and of medical personnel that has been, um, you know, um, alerting the people of the, the things they are lacking in our health system to tackle this pandemic. Uh, we've seen 
a, a lot of the things that we've seen also in China occur. Silence oh. the media, silencing um, medical personnel. It's important to have in mind that this occurs during very special situation, politically speaking. In Europe, they have their particular uh, situation. They just got out of the Brexit uh, discussion, but we have the United States that they have, they're, they're uh, facing an electoral uh, year. And also we have the situation in Venezuela that is, well, it is not uh, unknown that we have a dictatorship situation. So this pandemic deals with a lot of stuff that have to do with, with, uh, with you know, the political situation in our countries. I use that painting because during our independency in Venezuela in 1812, we have this earthquake and Simon Bolivar had this saying that if the nature is against us, we fight back and make her, you know, obey us. So we did see- Did he really say that though? He, is that a myth or did he really say that? Well, uh, a lot of people used to have that idea that probably he mentioned it, but the main idea here is that even though in catastrophes or epidemics or pandemics, the political uh, advantage that you can take about it. Let's remember that during those periods of time, you were not only fighting for independence, you were against the, the king, the king of Spain. And the king of Spain was there because God himself put him there. So considering yourself being in an in a independency way of thinking, you were in certain way against the God's will. Yeah, you were fighting God. If you're saying that if, if nature opposes us, we will continue. And that's, that's a little bit of, uh, of the same perspective and, and train of thought that Hugo Chavez had in 1999 when he had that awful catastrophe in La Guaira that killed at least 30,000 people. And that is a major natural disaster that not many people talk about outside of Venezuela, but we remember it very yes. well because we celebrated 20 years of, of that disaster. Uh, and it occurred during an election, uh, uh, during the elections, actually. It was in December. The elections were in December to reinstitute the Constitution. Um, so, and he said, we're going to go on with these elections. We don't care that there's a natural disaster. Actually, he asked people in La Guaira to go vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and we'll see. I, 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 another thing we have to be, you know, very conscious about is that during humanity, always we have been in situations like this. Probably right now we are more prepared, more prepared technically, but in health attention. Probably we're not well prepared into the political situation and handling of the political situation. And we can, you know, see pandemics since, you know, Athens. Uh, the fifth uh, uh, century before Christ, but we have Justinian past and the Black Death and so on and so on. And the most knowledge, I mean, the, the most recent during the, the 20th, uh, 20th century was the uh, Spanish flu. That also, I don't know if you have heard, the, grand, uh, the grandparent, the granddad of uh, Donald Trump died during the Spanish flu. Hmm. Um, well, we have to study probably if he had the effects and he got the effect of probably, but it's an, an important issue. Yeah. One thing that I want to you know mention is that during all these plagues and all these catastrophes, you always search someone who to blame. And during the, 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 the Black Death, the Jews were blamed for poisoning you know the waters and stuff. You always, societies always try to use these epidemics and this uh, catastrophe for a political perspective. Even, even the Spanish flu, uh, I, I, I heard, I don't know, you can corroborate, you've studied more about history than I have. Uh, wasn't the Spanish flu, uh, they called it the Spanish flu because the Spanish were the only ones that were actually saying the real death toll that it was causing in their country. And that's why it got named the Spanish flu. But actually many other countries that were suffering from this pandemic were not disclosing 
uh, the effects of the pandemic on their, on their countries. Well, it is called the Spanish flu because from Spain, where, you know, they delivered all the news about the flu, not because it was, you know, ended or, it had, or, it began, or began there or because, you know, they have more effects or the contrary, on the contrary, total contrary. What happens is that Spain had to have more freedom to say the real situation. Exactly. And that so, and had effects, and it had effects. It had effects because what happens, that was during or right after they finished the First World War. And so all the soldiers, they were, were back home and they had the, 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 the infection with them, the virus with them. So information is a big part of handling these pandemics. Even back, back way back when we didn't have any internet, uh, it was important to disclose how these, this pandemic was developing and what were the effects uh, on populations. And uh, it, it, it's always a determining factor in, in these pandemics and in solving them or not. Yes. Another aspect that we have to be, you know, really careful to talk about and to deal with it is that when you have these controls by the government, you always have some, some focus of, you know, riots and some um, problems with the society. And it's not new. We can see some search that probably in Moscow, they have this in 1871, but also we can refer to Zimbabwe when the government you know, try to stop the doctors and the sanitary officials for, you know, delivering and having the knowledge what what's going on at that moment. Even uh, we'll, we've seen news about the, 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 secret, the director of the OMS, the organization of, uh, or the, um, the World Health Organization, uh, he has been accused of not telling the whole truth about a pandemic that was occurring in Ethiopia at the time, the cholera uh, outbreak. Uh, he's been accused while he was health minister there of not disclosing the whole information. Well, this leads us to this presentation, these pictures over here. Dr. Mm -hmm. Li Wenlian was the first one, even last year, not was it even in 2020, he, using um, this uh, message um, app they have in China that is called WeChat, that he saw some people that was infected <clears throat> with this weird virus. And you know, well, you can imagine what the Chinese government did. Well, yeah, this was one of the first scandals that we saw uh, when this pandemic broke out in China. Uh, because in January, we were all talking about this doctor. Well, and he was taken we by the police. Thinking, oh, how is it possible that this doctor is now sick and he was the first one to announce it? I mean, this was one of the first um, scandals that China had to deal with in crisis control. Yes. And also, that takes us also to talk about the quarantine. Were these measures good? They were bad. How the governments dealt with it? Some of them, you know, they locked out the people. We'll see the, the situation in Italy. It was probably too late for some some effects. But what happens, for for instance, in Brazil? Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing Brazil uh, going on through some stuff right now because, uh, well, some want some uh, some people want to acknowledge it, others don't. They want to go out. They want to stay in, um, and it's one of the hardest hit countries in uh, South America. Ecuador has been hard right. hit as well, and which Peru. Is quite surprising. Peru in Peru is really, really, really intense. The the, infect, the infection, infection. See, however, no. I wanted to mention really briefly that one of the most important thing is prevention, and we'll see also taking and having knowledge, the data concerning the, the, the Spanish flu, how it happens in Philadelphia and St. Louis, how when they receive the soldiers coming from Europe from the First World War, in Philadelphia they have these gatherings, so a lot of people got infected, while in St. Louis didn't happen the same. Mm. 
Well, so do you think that we in Venezuela have been successful in prevention of the virus? Because uh, according to the official uh, data that the government uh, is saying, we are the country with least infect infectations and least deaths of uh, coronavirus. Well, now, a lot of people are putting in doubt those uh, numbers. I put it in doubt. But well, uh, we do have a low number because we would have known from the morgues or uh, from the family members of those people that have died. And um, it's been uh, relatively not that catastrophic as in other countries neighboring Venezuela. For sure, who has the knowledge, have the power. And you have to, if you have the knowledge and you have the power to stop spreading the real news and the information, you can control your own country. The thing is, what's going on if you are in a regime like we are dealing in Venezuela, that we are not very clear and we're not you know, really trustful. Well, they are not trustful in the information they deliver. The same happening with Cuba. Two or three weeks ago, well, I don't know if it's three weeks or one month, one month and a half, they mentioned it that they had no uh, infection at all. And they even said that they had the, the, the vaccine and they have, you know, the medicine for treatment. And we see that's all a lie. It's not, you know, nothing special to mention because all the regime, they, they do the same. Oh, let's talk about North Korea, and for instance. Kind of yeah, and it's kind of, well, it's, it's kind of uh, amazing how they've used it politically. I mean, yesterday or today, they, they sent some uh, medical team from Cuba to South Africa. They're helping out in different countries. But you know that there is a political inclination to all this help uh, that they're sending. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, they're also trying to do damage control from the last year's uh, of, of negative news towards Cuba. Um, but, you know, how much can they help with 20 or 30 uh, doctors uh, going to a different country? Yes, and another thing is technology is important and it's crucial in order to, you know, to prevent and to, for the treatment once the treatment, you know, is reached. And technology is impossible to talk about without, you know, the knowledge of it the apps, the applications. And another thing is what happens with the application if it's, you know, centralized. You can, you know, you can uh, silence some information, but also we have the importance of the decentralized applications. We won't talk about this, you know, in deep, but it's important because later we'll see how some uh, countries are dealing with these informations. Another thing is, yeah. do we keep people silenced of, of, of any opinion on any information they can deliver? Because we have some threats and some threats about, you know, freedom of expression and what happens with the fake news. We have seen a lot of fake news on what happens with the, with the, deep, the deep fakes. A lot of people believe some things because they are just, just in the, in the in the computers and the, and the networks. But what I think it is a danger is that some centralized uh, app, uh, applications, they can you know, forbid you to deliver some information. So we see how this pandemic crisis also leads some to some uh, impositions, probably radical impositions. Yeah, no, definitely. We've seen a lot of uh, fake news. I keep, I receive a fake news every day from family members on my social uh, media. Uh, and I am constantly trying to alert them. Look, this is fake. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different uh, platforms on the internet that are trying to, um, you know, debunk uh, fake news. Uh, I suggest you look at them every day to see what news they're debunking because it could be the news that you're receiving uh, at that moment. And in Venezuela, uh, like other countries, we have been subject to a lot of fake news. Yes, and another thing is, well, it's like a recommendation for all the people that, you know, is able to see if the, 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 the source 
is legitimate instead of you know just delivering any information you receive please check the sources if someone let's say a politician or let's say uh, I think, uh well, people in the, in the in the world of the technology well he says mention at this please go to the source all of these all these people have their own pages and they have their own profiles and if they mention something please check if they, he did or not but it's it's tricky because for example we we heard for weeks that this was a man-made virus as a conspiracy theory uh coming from the wuhan uh a virology institute of virology and i used to think i was one that said no that can't be true however the washington post uh disclosed some very uh, interesting information that uh, linked uh the coronavirus to a possible man-made or at least studied virus within the uh, institute of virology of wuhan so sometimes fake news may seem fake and it turns out to be either somewhat true or half true, there's still more investigation that needs to be done. And I, for one, would like to know more about uh, the origins of this virus, because it's hard to believe the Chinese government, after what we've seen they did to Dr. Uh, Li Liang and, uh, and other uh, things that they've done to silence uh, communication and information coming from uh, China about the virus. Yes, indeed. And I'll see also how this Taiwan issue was treated because mm -hmm. Taiwan one of, was one of the first countries to, you know, to announce the risks of this inf infection. And because it's not recognized within the communities of the states, especially within the, the uh, how, how you say it in English, uh, Organización Mundial de la Salud. Uh, well, the, wow. that, that, the world, that, that, world health organization yeah. yes it's written over there see yeah. and that also you know it, it is important to think are the political leaders assuming how they should this crisis some may think that yes some may think they not it is also important for the civil society to see what kind of leaders we want during situations like this and it's yes, I, mean, I think I think a lot of leaders did not uh, foresee it uh, as as something as grave as it became. For example, Boris Johnson, uh, he um, scoffed it off as something that wasn't that uh, that relevant, and then he became sick with the with the virus. And and yesterday or today, he he started back to work uh, after the after his his sickness uh, after overcoming coronavirus and he's saying that the world will change because of the coronavirus so a complete uh 180 from his uh position just a few months ago uh, of course after having lived through through the the sickness himself um let's see how much the world will change uh, but what you say is true there are leaders uh and the ones that you're pointing out that have been successful yes the, the, the situation, how it was dealt in New Zealand, is important to have it in mind. Also Taiwan, but especially these countries in a way up north. Because it, this is more than a pandemic uh, point of view. This is a political point of view, economical point of view, and we can't, you know, close our eyes to it. I want to mention especially the case of Germany, because even though the Chancellor, Angela Merkel, you know, that she took a couple days to think about it. She was right away over it. She mentioned it, 70 to 80% of the population will get infected. So that was enough to have, you know, the own conscience of the people to remain at home instead of obligating them. Yeah. No, I think, uh, and, and as you point out, uh, all of these countries that have been successful are run by women. Uh, so it is a, a, a huge uh, difference as how men are ruling countries. Uh, women, which were thought uh, to be more emotional, uh, you know, in, in another era, in another time, uh, as leaders, they have been quite logical and strategic in how they've um, handled the situation. And it, it's actually been 
very refreshing. Uh, in terms of Germany, Angela Merkel, who um, some people may uh, coincide politically, some people may differ, they all agree that she has done a magnificent job as a leader uh, handling this crisis. Because yes. she's been very technical and very, uh, very scientific in her delivery uh, and very honest as well. And I think that's very refreshing with any political leader right now. Let's see oh, if it happens in North Korea now that wow. <laughs> they're saying that, that Kim Jong-un's sister is going to take over. <laughs> Let's you're, see how. you're mentioning That's already good. North yeah. Korea. And this, and this presentation was prepared way before the news of today and yesterday's concerning. We don't know where the dictator of North Korea is right now, and we don't know what's going on. And all this happened during these pandemics. So it's interesting to see how these countries, free countries or not so free countries, the others, or totally blocked countries, locked, how they react. That's it is no different happened with Nicaragua. What happens with the president of Nicaragua during two or three weeks? He was absent totally. Or Cuba. Well, let's mention also Belarus. We don't know what's how going on about that. Well, see. Have you visited China? Have you been in China, uh, Oscar? I've never been to, to China. Well, a good friend of mine, she's a partner with me with some, uh, some business I have, Maria, Marianela Castro. She was in China during October and November. She was visiting China. Those pictures, she took those pictures. And she felt, she mentioned it, that the state control everything. So you feel, you know, you're being checked all the time, all the time in China. Well, and that reminds us what's going on on here. It is being checked only not physically, but also with the use of the, of the, of the technology. The WeChat application is like the regular WhatsApp. So everyone is watched. Everybody is under surveillance in China. But let's not forget that TikTok, that is this really famous application, is from China. So there are no guarantee at all that everyone that uses TikTok is being monitorized by China. And also, what happens with all those applications that are not from China, that, you know, that can tell you what to say and not to say, and they block you already. So yeah. that reminds me, this guy over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard it? Yes. You course. so you so you read 1984. So it's a good yeah. time during what's going on, besides the situation concerning the health treatment, how the states will use the pandemics in order to block the citizens. And you can do it not only one state, you can do it worldwide. Yeah, our friend George Orwell, I mean, I thought we were living in animal farm and now we're living in 1984. So <laughs> uh, at least animal farm had a happy ending. <laughs> or yes. a change at least or towards the end. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's very dystopic what, what, what we're... Um, we're seeing here in Venezuela, and we're already seeing it because, for for example, in the past few weeks, the Guaidos team has tried to have some kind of um, agenda towards coronavirus within the power that they have, which is minimal, and the power that they have, uh, or, or the following that they have, is mostly through digital uh, platforms and uh, the digital audience. So they've had, uh, they've. Um, made a lot of web pages to inform people about COVID-19 or to the most recent one to give monetary help to those uh, in the front line of the coronavirus, the medical teams, so to give them money. And all these web pages have been blocked. Um, Basin Filtro, which is an organization that you, we, you've had on your podcasts and we've had on our podcast too with uh, Andres Aspurua, has been following up on all the blocks, uh, the, the, the blockage that they've done to all the web pages of Juan Guaido. And it's really scary because they have technology 
that is really advanced to either block through DNS or create pages for phishing. That's phishing with pH uh, in order to, uh, well, uh, have a list of people that have accessed these web pages uh, that were promoting the opposition. So it's very scary. It's very scary indeed. Yes, yes. And also, it's important here to mention the idea. Remember that I mentioned it before the dApps that are technologies that are decentralized. So, if you have this uh, way to be around the blockage, the, the technological blockage, it will help a lot. So, we'll see how, in particular, the case in Venezuela, they're using the situation of the pandemics in order for more control more control of the people so you are you are being blocked in your house you're without you know without food without water without internet connection so it, it is tough what's going on here i want to mention i don't know if you have heard and read a little bit about the the um, how in uh, singapore they dealt with this Mm. They, they had this idea of test and trace because most important thing during a pandemic like this is making the tests. So you can say, well, we have these people infected or these people, well, too bad they died. But to, in order to prevent that, you need to increase the number of tests and then making the tracing of the test you did. So in case you had one person who got infected, you can tell the people who were around them if they were a test or not. So they developed this application that was called Trace Together. It is really important. And what important here is they, they say, uh, they, um, they deliver That's the information. I tried to download it. Of course, it's only for uh, their use. But it's interesting that they don't use your data. You are owner of your own data, and if you want, you can, you know, put, make it public. That's very interesting because it puts the power back to people's hands uh, and to society uh, on how they themselves can, uh, well, be a participant of a solution. Well, you're mentioning That's we're prevention. getting. Yes, you're mentioning the important is giving the power back to the people, to the civil society. So that's, that's the important idea of having civil society and digital civil society be aware of what we're facing. Because we have several threats. We have, let's say, a natural, well, natural threat that is the pandemics itself, but also we have another threats are you know totalitarian threats by these regimes yes totally and and uh, it, i think this uh fits this pandemic fits like a glove in the hand of authoritarianism and totalitarianism because they can excuse their controlling of society as a method of prevention of uh the pandemic and that's what we're seeing here as well well and we'll see that we have the right, the political right, our fundamental right, our human right to protest, to manifest. And how do you exercise that power if you know there is a pandemic, real, used by the governments and the totalitarian governments in order you know, to keep you locked in your house? And we see this case of Tel Aviv. They have this manifestation and they kept distance, all the beneficents, they had kept distance. So there are means, there are ways to exercise that, uh, ex that, um, that right to manifest well yeah, organized. Well, yeah, well, let's bring it back to Venezuela on this aspect, because what we've seen, we've seen that uh, this pandemic hit Venezuela at a very uh, interesting time for our country because uh, we are suffering from a severe gasoline shortage. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we haven't been able to record the podcast accordingly, because we can't even get out of the house if we wanted to, 
just because there's no gasoline, I haven't been able to uh, find any gasoline for my car for the past month. So uh, it's very difficult to mobilize. And that has uh, increased the prices of food that has uh, uh, limited the access and distribution of food and medicines and all kinds of things. And that has prompted people to go out and loot. And we are seeing uh, various episodes of looting all over the country in different parts um, with, uh, uh, well, little to no, uh, um, you know, consequences uh, of this looting. And actually that is, it's not one that I condone. It's not, I mean, it's not something that I support uh, the looting, but it's also a form of protest, isn't it? Yes, it is. Another thing, have you read the numbers of the, the death toll in Venezuela? I don't know how many are they, 23, I guess, or less than that? There's not that many. There's not that many. And uh, we haven't been seeing um, uh, people um, or the family members of people going up to the news and talking about uh, their deaths. Uh, we've ta I've talked to some doctors that say that uh, there are some cases uh, that are being counted not as coronavirus victims, but just as heart attack or respiratory uh, failure, but they are not being counted as coronavirus victims. Now, uh, these doctors that I've spoke, spoken with, they've also said that uh, we do have a lower uh, number of infected and deaths and that's probably, it's, it's lower than other countries in South America, but higher than what the government is saying, um, allegedly. Uh, and that's because uh, they say that we had very low traffic of people coming in from Europe or from the United States before the pandemic struck. So um, they're blaming uh, the fact that we were already an isolated country because of the whole political and economic crisis that we didn't have as many people from outside coming in and uh, bringing the virus in Venezuela. However, uh, I don't think we are, because there are some things that the government is not doing right in prevention. There are some areas in Caracas that are not using face masks or and they're going to the streets and doing commerce just normally, that we are not uh, near the, um, yeah, the, the, the peak of the um, coronavirus infections in Venezuela, and that can come later if uh, measures aren't taken into account. Uh, it is really scaring what's going on because another thing that's going on is the criminalization of the infection. So if you are infected and you go to this uh, uh, hospital and stuff, you're going to be Probably, probably treated as a criminal, because we saw when you know you can you know be uh, against it or not. Some people that had uh, a party, and some of them were uh, infected, and they were treated like criminals. On the other side, you were not only criminalizing the infection, but also victimizing the infection. So it, yeah. either either way, it's going to be used has a political intent of getting the control of the people. But at the same time, you know what worries me uh, more to me? The latest, count, the latest count is 321 uh, infected and 10 deaths. 10 deaths only. Well, That's, it's too bad. One, one death is too much. I mean, it's too much going on. But how many but deaths? It's unbelievable. It's yes. unbelievable. Yes, but the death toll of crime, how much is it? How many people died? on crime uh, issues. Well, now much less because everybody's at home, but. Thousand something I read, mm. more than thousand. <laughs> so you're during a pandemic and the pandemic, yeah. real or not the number, only 10 people is not bad. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not bad dying, it's too bad, but if you compare it with another situation we have, it is worse. And the, the use of this information and this situation for controlling the, so, the civil society is what worries me the most. 
Yeah, it, it is very worrisome. We are um, hoping that something uh, happens in order to inform us better or for, I know today uh, the United Nations is discussing uh, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela because uh, let's not forget that this pandemic hit Venezuela in the middle of a humanitarian crisis and uh, a health crisis as well, a, a, um, a health system crisis as well. So there is no way we are prepared for uh, a major uh, numbers of infected and death tolls in Venezuela. Uh, I, I think that would destroy uh, not only the country, but the revolution as well. Uh, that's not something that we want to happen uh, for coronavirus to, because it's gonna be very hard to recover from that. Uh, but we do need help. And we do need help from international organizations. Well, Oscar, yes, we do need help. We, we had it, I mean, we were dealing with it. And you see how the government or the regime blocked it. And yeah. uh, well, the effects are way harder than you can see it in another countries. That from that perspective, from that perspective of liberty, democracy, and so on. Oscar, I guess uh, we'll see if this conversation. I enjoy it very much. We, we'll yeah, see if we can, we can upload it. Upload it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's hope because it's not. I, I just want to stress out that it's not only. Uh, the uh, danger of coronavirus and COVID-19 for health system in Venezuela, but the consequences that that brings. Uh, we've been talking a lot uh, this week about uh, um, um, hunger uh, and uh, people dying of hunger uh, because of this pandemic, uh, altering the commerce and the distribution of food in Venezuela. That is something that we are going to see um, a famine uh, yes. That's the word. I'm for. Yes. So uh, those are issues that we will probably be discussing in further and future Venezuela and focus. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening in uh, for the special edition of Venezuela and Focus. We're back, uh, at least at home, and we plan to do some more. Yes. Well, Oscar, take care and be safe. Take care and be safe. Hasta luego. Ciao. Salud. You know what? You know what we forgot? The saying. You always have the a saying. saying. Yes. Well, you, don't, you don't have any saying. saying. Oh my goodness! There are so many sayings. I think we've said a lot of them. Um, probably, I think a good one here would be. Let me think. Um, oh. Boy, I can't think of one right now. Wow. Let's, let's do something. If if anybody there that's bilingual, that's Venezuelan American, and, and can think up of a good Venezuelan saying that we can use for this podcast, for this edition of Venezuelan Focus, please leave it down in a comment uh, with the translation. And uh, don't forget to comment and subscribe to our channels. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Ciao. Uy, cuánto